Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? The same murder three. Strange things did happen here, and no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree. Welcome to Strange Things, broadcasting from the Arkanasa Radio Studios in Laredo, Texas. And welcome to the show. I'm your host, Chris James. Just got back from the Texas Bigfoot Conference in Jefferson, Texas. Well, actually, I got back Sunday, but... This is the first show since then, so tonight's subject will be the Texas Bigfoot Research Center's convention. If you haven't been, you really ought to consider going. Jefferson is considered the Bigfoot capital of Texas. Kind of happened that way because Craig Woolheater started his uh, Bigfoot Center there in Jefferson. And what with all the tourism it brings into the town and all the folks coming in and spending money, it makes the locals pretty happy. So now Texas has its own Bigfoot uh, capital, and that will be in Jefferson. At one time, the TBRC did move to Taylor, Tyler, Texas. It moved uh, for unknown reasons. Once it was in Tyler, it seemed to be doing pretty good. The trouble is, they kept trying to change things. If you've got something that's working, you might as well stick with it. But the guys running the TBRC, uh, aside from Craig, decided they didn't want to be called Bigfoot anymore. They wanted to be called the North American Wood Ape, which, you know, that's, that's their choice. I attended a private gathering while I was up there in Tyler. Uh, I'd given them some money and they thought I was a decent human being and so they invited me to a private function I guess with the uh, understanding that I might decide to join the group. While I was there a lot of folks were talking about fringe folks. Fringe being anybody look for UFOs or ghosts or anything weird. Anything weird other than Bigfoot. Well, at the time, I had a baseball cap that my wife had bought me from Bill Burns. It was the UFO magazine hat that you see him wearing on his TV show, UFO Hunters. And I wore that hat everywhere. I've still got it. I still wear it on occasion. Well, this one guy was standing there lecturing me about how they didn't want the fringe people hanging around. They didn't want those those weirdos that went looking for UFOs and ghosts. And he rattled on about this subject for a good 10 minutes before he noticed the hat I was wearing. And I saw his eyes roll up, focus on my hat. And then he started stammering and stuttering and I guess he decided he didn't really want to talk to me anymore. <laughs> I guess I was too fringe for him. And he abruptly turned and walked away. I had kind of decided at that point in time that I wasn't going to go to any more TBRC functions. Well, then they changed the name to North American Wood Ape. And once the Texas Bigfoot Research Center's name was free, Craig Wilheater snatched it back up and he moved the conference back to Jefferson. So, we're back in Jefferson, and I'm back to attending the functions because they no longer have that weird attitude about, we don't want those ghost hunters or UFO hunters hanging around. Really. I find it hilarious that somebody that spends hours, days, weeks, sitting out in the woods looking for a large hair-covered creature thinks that anybody that goes looking for ghosts is weird. Personally, I don't think anyone is weird who has a passion to spend the time and the money looking into something like this. Heck, there are people on this planet that are convinced that the planet is flat. Well, that's their choice. 
What I don't understand is why don't they just take a trip over to the very edge and look over the side? Probably because they can't find the edge or maybe they just don't like the thought of knowing for sure that it's flat or not. Kind of reminds me of a Terry Pratchett set of books. If you've never read Terry Pratchett's books, you're missing a really entertaining time. Uh, his world is called the Disc World, and it's flat, and it sits on the top of four elephants. And these four elephants are standing on the back of a giant sea, uh, space turtle named a Tune, and the space turtle is flying through outer space, and that's how the Disc World is transported from one place to another. I know it sounds a bit weird, but hey, it's a fantasy science fiction set of stories, and yeah, like I said, they're well worth reading if you ever get a chance. Well, let me get back to the TBRC, since that is the subject I'm supposed to be talking about. This year, they had a great lineup of folks. We had Bobo Fay and Cliff Barackman from Finding Bigfoot. They were kind of the the main attraction. Now, they were the guys there that a lot of folks wanted to talk to because they've seen them on TV a lot. There was She Squatch running around making people's lives interesting. Now, She Squatch, well, you'd have to see her to know what she looks like. The thing is, looking at her in a lit room as she traipsed about doing her thing, she was a little intimidating looking. I could just imagine running into something that looked like that in the middle of the night in a dark forest. That could really scare the heck out of you. All in good fun, but uh, her and her companion, Bigfoot, were running around the conference. You could get your picture taken with her or him, depending on which of the two or both, if you preferred. Uh, Shelley Covington Montana was the first speaker of the, the day. Uh, Shelley uh, grew up in Texas, and her father was a DPS trooper. I'm not going to go into too much of Shelley's story, because she has agreed to be on the show sometime soon, and hopefully she'll be one of my next interviews. Hopefully. I know life happens, and sometimes people can't make things like that, but we'll see what happens. Well, Shelley had uh, the opportunity, the insight, foresight to develop a DNA collecting kit. If you want to buy a DNA collecting kit to pick up Bigfoot samples, let's say you find a huge pile of poo in the woods and you think it might be from Bigfoot, or you find some hairs stuck on a barbed wire fence and you want to collect them and have them checked, you don't want to just reach over and grab them with your hand. As Shelley says, you might as well put it in your mouth. Which, that sounds pretty nasty. So, she was going to get a DNA collecting kit, but those things are expensive. It's kind of like the manufacturers think that, well, we've got an item here that nobody else has, and so we're just going to charge as much money as we can get. Kind of like the drug companies. So Shelley went out and she developed her own DNA collecting kit. Now the neat thing about her kit is most of these items that you buy from some website somewhere, you will get one pair of gloves and one pair of tweezers and one collecting kit, one sample bag. Well Shelley put several sets of gloves and other items in there because her idea of collecting samples is... You not only want to collect the sample, but you want to have somebody assisting you. Assisting you to the point that they actually videotape you as you collect the sample. Because that way you've got documentation of when and where and how the sample was picked up. If you just show up at a lab somewhere with a bag full of poo, you might have picked it up in the park after your dog had done his business. So Shelley has made it a standard policy that if you pick up a sample, you have somebody film it. So that way you can say, look, this is 
where we found it, this is how it was collected, and this is when it was collected. You've got it all on tape, and that way in the future you can show when, where, why, and how you got your samples. A very interesting speaker. She, uh, like I said, will hopefully be on the show soon. Ken Gerhardt was there, as usual. He's one of the normal speakers at the Bigfoot Conference in Texas, uh, seeing as he lives here. Uh, Ken has been on the show several times in the past. Well, unfortunately, every time Ken has agreed to come on my show, strange things have happened. Uh, the first time was the first year I was doing the show. He'd agreed to come on, but... Due to the fact that he is a busy man, I had to kind of arrange to record the show ahead of time. I called him up. We talked for about an hour and a half. It was it was interesting. It was informative. I went to play the show back, and there was nothing there. The gremlins got to me. I told Ken that, unfortunately, the show didn't take. And so that Saturday, there was no strange things on the air. Ken has a new book out, and of course I bought several copies. I would mention the name, but I can't think of it right off the top of my head. Anyway, they make good Christmas presents. If you've got somebody that you'd like to buy Christmas presents for, and you just don't know what to get them, I suggest getting books. After all, people should read. All my nieces and nephews... That's what they get for Christmas. That's what they get for birthdays. Books are a good gift. You don't need any batteries. You don't need to plug the thing in. You can take it anywhere you go. And you learn something while using it. Ah, here it is. It's the Essential Guide to Bigfoot. His latest book, it's available at Amazon.com. Or, if you can track Ken down, you can get a signed copy of your very own, which I happen to have gotten several of. As I said, good Christmas presents. Oh, the second time I had Ken on the show, I called him up, and we were doing the recording, and before I got started, Ken told me that his cell phone was acting up a bit. And boy, was it. I recorded the show, and then before hanging up, I played it back real quick to make sure this time I had him on the show. And, well, his volume was about half of what mine was. When I was listening to him on the phone, he sounded perfectly clear, perfectly good. All the lights were lighting up on the mixer like they should. However, his volume was, like I said, about 50% of mine. So, before I could put the show out on the air, I had to go through and edit it. I went through the entire recording, and I cut out every single time Ken talked. And then I spliced all of his conversation together on one track and put mine on another. I turned his track way up, and I turned mine way down, and I had to fiddle with it for... About five hours until I finally got a show that was acceptable. It wasn't perfect, but at least it didn't sound like he was in a tin can and I was yelling into the mic. Ken is always an interesting person to talk to or to listen to. Nick Redfern also showed up, but he was there to sell books. He also has uh, several books out lately. Uh... How anyone can write so many books is beyond me. It's kind of a joke amongst the Bigfoot folks. Well, amongst anybody at a convention that uh, Ken, will, I mean, correction, Nick will write a book while uh, traveling to a conference. Interesting to talk to these people. The nice thing about talking to these folks is they're not like Hollywood people that you see on TV. You can actually walk up to their table. You can get your picture taken with them. You've probably seen Nick on Ancient Aliens, as well as lots of other TV shows. But, like I said, Nick wasn't there to speak. He was just there to sell some of his books.
The, uh, the next speaker was Chester Moore. Now, Chester Moore has also been on the show in the past. Uh, Chester has uh, received the Hero of Conservation Award. He's a big proponent of animal conservation here in Texas. He also has a zoo. It's called the Kingdom Zoo. It, it's for young kids that have had traumatic experiences in their lives. If you have a few extra dollars laying around the house and you're looking for a decent place to send it, instead of sending it to some politician up in Washington who will just blow it on booze and illicit women, you should send your contributions to the Kingdom Zoo where it will actually be put to some good use. Chester's always interesting to listen to. He uh, he had taken a young kid out on a uh, wish exploration that the kid had had. And the kid wanted to have an encounter of any kind with Bigfoot. And so Chester was driving this kid around in an area that was known to have some activity. And nothing was happening. It was one of those occasions. You can't force Bigfoot to make an appearance or to vocalize. All you can do is hang out in the area and hope for the best. Well, Chester Moore was winding it down for the evening, and as they were driving out of the area, he would stop every once in a while and get out of the vehicle, and he'd make a few vocalizations trying to get Bigfoot to respond. Well, on the third stop, he made a whooping sound and something responded to him. Now, the kid was delighted that he was able to actually have a Bigfoot experience, something to talk about when he got home. If you uh, aren't familiar with the history of Bigfoot and why we call him that, originally Bigfoot was called the Hairy Man or Sasquatch. Or the wild man. Trying to turn my notebook without making too much noise here. But the name Bigfoot didn't come about until 1958. <clears throat> they were building a road through the woods. And the bulldozer operator, a man named Jerry Crew, started noticing that there were some very large footprints on the ground around his machine. Now, you normally would uh, suspect that this was done by some human. However, these tracks were huge. They were 16 inches long, and there was 45 to 60 inches between each track. You measure them from one heel mark to the next. Well, Jerry said that whoever or whatever this creature was, he had a really big foot. Two words. Well, somebody made the mistake of claiming that Jerry Crew was lying, and uh, that really pissed him off because he was not that sort of individual. He was a staunch member of his church, and he really got mad that anyone would accuse him of anything short of being totally honest. Well, he went to the newspaper, and he was telling them what he had found, and he showed them the plaster casts that he made of these tracks. Well, the people at the newspaper looked at this huge, big foot, and they turned it into one word, Bigfoot. And from that moment on, we've had the term, the name, Bigfoot. Well, a lot of folks are mistaken under the uh, impression that there's just one Bigfoot out there. Some people have actually asked, isn't Bigfoot getting kind of old? Or uh, how did Bigfoot manage to get from California to, say, Washington State or to the middle of Texas? They don't realize that we talk about Bigfoot, it's not one creature. It's several creatures, kind of like fish. You've got one fish, you've got a thousand fish. You've got one Bigfoot, or you can have a thousand Bigfoot. It's both plural and singular. I get a kick out of it when people say Bigfoots or Bigfeets. 
or try to pluralize the word. Not necessary. It's like money. You have money. It's plural and singular. I've heard people say, especially people that think they're really well educated, that will say monies as if that's such a word. Or fishes. Once again, it's both plural and singular. You don't have to add an ES on the end. You've got money, you've got fish, you've got Bigfoot. Well, somebody thought that maybe Ray Wallace, the man who was the contractor to build the road, maybe he was the one pulling off a prank, you know, messing with his employees. As if a contractor didn't have anything better to do than slow down the production of the road by going out and hoaxing a Bigfoot sighting, which would bring all construction to a halt. What a lot of people didn't realize about Ray Wallace was he became very interested in finding out exactly what Bigfoot actually was. He actually hired two professional hunters to hang around the construction site trying to find out what was causing these huge footprints. These two hunters brought in a pack of dogs to see if they could find this creature. Well, the dogs began disappearing. It is said by many folks that Bigfoot has a taste for dogs, or he just doesn't like them, one of the two. Now you will find folks out there that will say, Oh, when Ray Wallace was dying, he admitted that he had hoaxed all of the tracks. And yes, they did find some huge wooden feet that had been carved and they were stored in Ray Wallace's tool shed. However, Ray Wallace was actually spending a lot of money on any person that could give him any form of evidence of Bigfoot being real. He would run around to the different Indian tribes and he would interview them. He never called Bigfoot an it. He referred to it as he or she. As for those wooden feet that they found in his storage shed, well, you take one of those wooden feet and you strap it to the bottom of your foot and then try to take a step let alone 45 to 60 inch step. It's kind of like wearing diving fins. You strap those suckers on and, well, you're not going to walk very far because you can't bend your foot. You can't put a large wooden fake foot on your body and then walk anywhere. Ray Wallace never said that he hoaxed anything. That was a story that came out long after he had died. A husband and wife were flying over the road construction area because they had heard about these sightings. And they actually spotted a huge hair-covered creature standing down on a trail below the plane. <coughs> Excuse me. They tried circling around to see if they could get a better sight of the thing. But by the time they got the plane turned around, the creature had disappeared. Lots of uh, folks in and around that area have had sightings. The local tribe, the, the Hoopa Indians, they have legends <clears throat> when it comes to dealing with Bigfoot. If you're out in the woods and you've caught, say, several fish, and you encounter Bigfoot standing in the brush, you are to leave half of the fish that you caught for Bigfoot kind of an offering. If you only have one fish, well, you're supposed to leave that fish on the ground and then walk away. Kind of a peace offering to the Bigfoot creatures. It's a, it's a tradition in the tribe, and I believe that the Indians probably know a heck of a lot more about Bigfoot than any of our researchers out there. Ken Gerhardt, when he was talking, was doing the statistics that folks have found while investigating Bigfoot. He took all of the reports, all the sightings, and he kind of mashed them all together, and then he pulled out the 
commonalities. For example, if you take all the Bigfoot sightings, the average height of the creature is about 7 foot 6 inches tall. When Roger Patterson filmed that creature walking along the side of Bluff Creek, then later they asked him how tall he thought it was, he said about 7.5 feet tall, which According to most reports, that's about how tall they think Bigfoot is. Most creatures say that Bigfoot is either dark, dark black, brown, or kind of a dark reddish color. However, there are a few reports of Bigfoot being a kind of a grayish color, like an old man with gray hair. Now, a lot of people are under the impression that when you see Bigfoot, he's going to smell pretty bad. Kind of like a, a wet dog that's been rolling in dead creatures and garbage. Well, that's only associated with about 15% of sightings. And most of those sightings are always in Florida. Now, in Florida, they have something called the skunk ape. And it's called the skunk ape because it is always accompanied by a nasty smell. So if you're ever watching a TV show and the, the people are sniffing the air and they say, Ooh, it smells like garbage. There must be a Bigfoot around. Well, either they're in Florida or they're not actually having a Bigfoot sighting. Another interesting item that Ken brought up was the fact that there had to be about 4,000 Bigfoot living in the United States in order for the creatures to continue to exist. You have to have what's called a breeding population. Now, Ken works at the San Antonio Zoo. He works with wildlife, so he knows what it takes to keep an animal like this alive. Well, some people think Bigfoot's an animal. I tend to think he's something a little more but that's just me. They also believe, according to the research Ken did, that each creature would need a area of about a thousand square miles to travel about, uh, find enough food to eat, uh, breed, and also avoid contact with humans. Oh, why would Bigfoot avoid contacting humans? Well, think about how many times people have seen something they didn't know what it was. It scared them, and so they shot at it. We don't exactly have the best reputation when it comes to making contact with the unknown. Uh, so it's a pretty good, uh, reasonable assumption that Bigfoot would probably want to stay away from humans. Maybe we scare him or them, as bad as they scare us. Uh, when I was up in, uh, not Jefferson, I was up in Huntsville at the 2017 Bigfoot Conference, the first one ever held, a man that I was talking to, we were standing in line waiting to talk to Bobo, this man was telling me about how there is a correlation between Bigfoot sightings, UFO sightings, and people disappearing up around the Sam Houston Park. This guy had done a lot of investigations into Bigfoot sightings. He'd also done some investigations into UFO sightings. I was pretty much fascinated by what the man was telling me, and I took notes as he was speaking. Unfortunately, one thing I did not get was the man's name. And of course, when you're standing in a huge crowd of people and everybody's talking all at once, it's a little difficult to get all the details down straight. If by some mysterious chance you happen to recall a speaking to me about Bigfoot, UFOs, and people disappearing while at the Huntsville Bigfoot Conference, uh, send me an email and let me know because I'd love to get the rest of these details. Uh, Ken is always interesting to listen to. 
He always has some really fascinating things to say. If you haven't caught his TV show, Missing in Alaska, it was very well worth watching. It's just a crying shame that they only showed the first three episodes on the History Channel and then they bumped the show over to the History 2 channel that was kind of reserved for different types of shows, uh, getting away from the actual history and into a little more paranormal stuff. And then History 2 just kind of disappeared. It became something else. Uh, it's a hard show to catch, but every once in a while you will find it on the Discover Channel. Well worth watching. It's Missing in Alaska. Now, Ken is the man with the black leather cowboy hat with the big skull on the front. Lionel Blackburn was also at the Jefferson Conference, another person that's always entertaining to listen to. Lyle is a musician, an author, a TV producer, and he's had a lot to do with all the reports coming out of Falk, Arkansas. He has a voice that you just want to listen to. He was the one that has said on more than one occasion that people will ask him, isn't Bigfoot getting a little old? They kind of are under the impression that the one and only Bigfoot was the one captured on film by Bob Gimlin and Roger Patterson back in 1958. Ah, correction, 63. I'll get the date right one of these days. I have notes in a notebook sitting on my desk. I have notes on my computer. And I have notes inside my head. And I'm trying to keep all three from getting too mixed up. Anyway, Lyle Blackburn <clears throat> was telling us about some of the latest sightings coming out of the Falk, Arkansas area. He also mentioned that the movie that got just about everyone interested in Bigfoot, aside from the P&G film, The Legend of Boggy Creek, which came out way back, uh, trying to think of the man's name, Charles Pierce had heard about this creature running around in Falk, Arkansas. And he decided that he was going to go to Falk and he was going to film the area, kind of make a documentary of the whole thing. So Charles borrowed some money from a trucking company, and he drove to Falk, which was only a little ways from Texarkana. Then he got to talking to all the locals, and he got the folks in town to portray themselves interacting with this creature that was supposed to have been uh, seen in the area. He needed somebody to dress up to look like the creature, and so he got one of the locals, a very tall individual, to put on this suit and just run around in the woods, and they filmed him. Uh, the person portraying the Bigfoot was Smokey Crabtree's son, and Smokey Crabtree was one of the Bigfoot researchers way back before Bigfoot was a thing. He'd been looking into Bigfoot sightings for years before anybody even knew to call it Bigfoot. Well, they call it the Falk creature instead of Bigfoot, but it's kind of the same thing. One thing that Lyle was talking about was game cameras. How, for some mysterious reason, they can't seem to catch Bigfoot on a game camera. And there are literally thousands of them out there in the woods now. So why is it, do you suppose, Bigfoot never shows up on a game camera? Well, they've been doing some research about coyotes and game cameras. The, uh, the folks studying the coyote population wanted to see the alpha male in action. He's the, the head of the pack. He's the guy that kind of tells all the other coyotes when to attack and where to go and where they're going to spend the night. He's the head honcho. He's the Simba of the coyote pack. Well, they get to noticing that the alpha male never seemed to get caught on camera. And they wanted to know why. 
So they got to thinking that perhaps there is something about the game camera, maybe the infrared autofocus, is allowing these coyotes to know that there's a game camera in the area, and therefore they just simply avoid the area. They've also discovered that bears are attracted to game cameras. There's something to do with the smell attracts bears and they like to eat game cameras. Now I know that dogs can sense when a camera is being pointed at them. Our dog uh, Kay used to hang out here before she went to the other side. A K would be sitting in the room, and I could point a camera at her, and she'd just sit there and look at me, not, not acting at all. However, when I turned the power on, all of a sudden she would sneak away. She would not allow me to take her picture as long as the camera was turned on. I could point the camera at her any time I wanted to as long as it wasn't functioning. So there was something being emitted from the camera that she could sense. So I am under the impression that probably Bigfoot has the same ability. We haven't sat down and talked to a Bigfoot yet, so we don't know what they can and can't do. So perhaps the reason we don't catch any Bigfoot sightings on game cameras is they can sense that there's a camera there. They can feel it, or they can smell it, or maybe they can see the infrared triggering device. And why not? It's possible. Other creatures can see it, so why couldn't Bigfoot? A hilarious thing about Lyle Blackburn is a lot of people mistake him and Ken Gerhart as being the same person. And then they decide that Maybe they're brothers or something. If you ever see the two standing side by side, or if you meet one and then you run into the other, you'll probably think that they're both the same person. They both wear black cowboy hats that are kind of misshapen. They both have Van Dyke beards. They both wear a lot of black clothing. And when Lyle was talking up on stage... He did say that it could have been him, or it could have been he, uh, Ken that had done something, because he claims that even they get each other mixed up. Uh, Cliff Berkman was one of the speakers. Now, Cliff has been on the show as well. Several years ago, I managed to convince him to, to come on and uh, talk for an hour. Now, of all the interviews I've done, uh, Cliff Berrickman was one of the more interesting. He talked for an hour and a half when I called him, recorded the show, a very interesting subject matter. And then when I went to play the show back, there was nothing there. His voice was nothing but static, and I don't know how it happened. Uh, maybe the wire was loose. Well, I was in a bit of a panic because that sort of thing isn't supposed to happen. And I told a lot of people that uh, Cliff Berrickman was going to be on the show. And I told Cliff uh, the show didn't record. And he said, okay, let's do it again. So we immediately went back and re-recorded the show. The second time, I checked every wire in the, the studio and the recording came through okay. Uh, Cliff is a former school teacher, and he likes collecting casts of not just Bigfoot footprints, but also handprints, and he has studied a lot of handprints. He doesn't like the nice, neat, normal-looking footprints. He's more into the misshapen ones, because they tell a story. You look at just a normal flat footprint and all it is is a footprint. Whereas you look at one that's kind of misshapen, kind of screwed up a bit, and you can say, okay, the creature was walking along here and he slid in the mud or he was going up the hill or he was turning this direction. So Cliff talks a lot about prints. 
And like I said, not just footprints, but handprints as well. A cliff says that the shape of the footprint is not the shape of the track. The, the track is the damage done to the ground as the creature is walking. That's not exactly how he says it, but that's how my notes say. It's difficult for me to sit in a room full of people listening to a speaker and write everything that they're saying. Most people write at about 60 words a minute. Most people speak at 120 words a minute. That's why they invented shorthand. Well, Cliff also talked about the fact that they found a bunch of what they call nests in the Pacific Project area. These nests are what look like a giant bird nest, I guess you could say. The something large has gone into the woods, broken off a bunch of branches, laced them together into a nice big round sleeping area, and then spent the night there. What made it very interesting is that mountain gorillas also will make nests like this. The mountain gorillas will teach their young how to make a nest, and the young when they make their nests, they don't make them on the ground, but they make them up in the trees. And at the Pacific Project, apparently they have found several of these suspected Bigfoot nests, not just on the ground, but in the trees as well. They've also recorded a lot of vocalizations from this area where the nests were found. A James Bobo Fay was the last speaker. Uh, this is the second time I've heard the man speak in public. And, well, as always, he was highly entertaining and hilarious. Bobo had a lot to say about the production company, and most of it wasn't, wasn't very good or very nice. Apparently, the crew, the, the folks on Finding Bigfoot, and the people making the show didn't get along very well. And I can understand this. You got people, dedicated researchers, who are out looking for Bigfoot. And that's what they want to do. Now, if you're a real dedicated researcher, and you hear something in the woods, a snap of a tree, a limb, or something howl, the first thing you're going to want to do is determine was that a bear walking through the woods? Was that howling sound a coyote? Or maybe an owl? Was that screaming sound I heard simply a female fox? Well, the production crew would immediately go into this, Oh, that was Bigfoot. Act like it was Bigfoot. Try to pretend like that was Bigfoot. And the researchers are like, No, we don't know what that was, and until we can prove one way or the other, we're not going to say it was Bigfoot. Well, this would lead to a lot of arguments between the production company and the crew, or the, the cast of the show. It would get to a point on some occasions where they would actually have to bring in the big executives out in Hollywood in order to smooth over any disagreements between the cast and crew. Uh, Bobo talked a lot about some of the folks that were on the show with them, like... Uh, Ernie Brown, the Turtle Man. Uh, apparently Ernie is a pretty colorful individual. I wonder why they took his show off TV. I always enjoyed it, even though it was kind of the same thing every week. It just, he was such a interesting character to watch. Uh, the show was, I mean, the correction, the, the, yeah, the TV show, Finding Bigfoot, was eventually canceled not because of a lack of interest. There were literally thousands of people that watched it every time it was on TV. Now, the show cost a lot of money to manufacture. They had four crew members that each night had to have a hotel room. Each day they had to have food. They had to drive them around the country, around the planet actually, and they had to film them looking for Bigfoot. 
Then they had the production crew that also had to have hotel rooms and food and gas and travel around the planet looking for Bigfoot. So when all is said and done, the cost of producing Finding Bigfoot far exceeded what the folks in Hollywood were willing to spend. And so after several years of entertaining us, they decided they were no longer going to have the show. Which is sad, but, well, maybe they'll come up with something better someday. You can still catch a lot of interesting subjects from both Cliff Berrickman and Bobo Fay. If you look on YouTube, you can find them at interviews. You can find them doing different uh, research projects. So if you're, if you're a fan of Finding Bigfoot, you need to get yourself to one of these conferences and speak to these folks. They're always entertaining to talk to, and they're not like most Hollywood folks where you just can't get near them. They're more than happy to have their picture taken with you, and sometimes they'll even come on podcast. Unfortunately, when I finally got my photo taken with Bobo Fay in Huntsville, he was eating his lunch, and so it kind of looks like he's got the mumps in the photograph that my wife took. The, uh, the history of looking for Bigfoot is kind of uh, messed up, simply because there are so many folks out there that claim that every time Bigfoot has been seen or heard or recorded on film, that the people doing the encounter are hoaxing it and yes there are folks out there that are more than happy to make hoaxes I'm not going to mention his name but there's this one guy who is associated with Bigfoot his, uh, his name comes up a lot who found a frozen Bigfoot in Georgia of all places they had Bigfoot in a big block of ice, and they were going to show it to the public. And uh, if you're willing to pay a few bucks, you were going to be able to see a frozen Bigfoot. Uh, kind of like the Minnesota Iceman, only not. Well, it turns out that the uh, frozen Bigfoot was actually just a gorilla costume in a block of ice. Not the least bit surprising, considering that the man in charge of this... Uh, frozen Bigfoot, was also the perpetrator of a hoax on Coast to Coast one year. If y'all were fans of the show, you may recall that several years ago, a Bigfoot researcher claimed that they were going to put game cameras all over the side of a mountain, and that if you would give him $20 a month, you would receive uh, access to the website where you could sit there and watch the mountain and hopefully spot Bigfoot moving around. A lot of people sent their money in. And then a lot of people said they went to the website and it wasn't working. Well, after several months of trying to get the straight story out of this man, uh, finally somebody, George Norrie, I believe, was able to get the guy to confess to the fact that A... There were no game cameras out there. B, the website was never set up. And C, all that money he'd collected from all of those dedicated folks had been spent. Now, they tried to get him to send the money back to the people, but I don't think anybody ever got their money back. I am just so glad that I never got taken in. Well, then a lot of people will claim that Roger Patterson made the creature that he filmed back in 1967. So far, there have been 13 different people come forward and claim that they were the ones in the suit. The story goes that Roger Patterson had heard about Bigfoot, and he thought that that would be a good way to make a buck, or maybe a couple hundred. He needed someone that could take him out into the woods on horseback, somebody that was good with horses, and who also owned a pickup truck that could tow a trailer. So he got a hold of Bob Gimlin, who was very good on horseback, and he owned a pickup that could pull the trailer. So Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin went into the woods 
there by Bluff Creek, October 1967, looking for Bigfoot. As they're riding through the trees, Roger Patterson's horse was spooked by something. It reared up and it fell to the side, pinning Roger's leg to the ground. Roger and Bob both noticed this large, hair-covered creature walking away from them through the trees. So Patterson quickly scrambled to get his camera out of the saddlebags. Then he ran towards the creature, trying to film it. That's why the Roger Patterson film is so shaky. Patterson is running through the trees, holding a camera, trying to film. As he's running... It suddenly dawns on him that this creature just might turn around and kill him. So he yells over his shoulder back to Bob. Bob, cover me. So Bob Gimlin pulls a 30-30 rifle out of his saddle holster and puts a round in the chamber. If you've ever heard somebody lever a bullet into the chamber of a 3030 rifle, it's not the kind of thing you're going to hear and think, oh, was that a car door? Or, ooh, what was that sound? No, you would hear that sound and you will say, somebody is about to put a bullet in the back of my head. As Bob Gimlin is working the lever on his 3030, the creature, known as Patty, turns and looks over her shoulder towards Bob. And then she just keeps walking along as if nothing. Had that actually been a man in a suit, don't you think he would have thrown his hands in the air and screamed, don't shoot? Don't you think he would have ducked his head down between his shoulders and tried running away? No, the creature just looked over its shoulder and calmly kept walking. As for it being somebody in a suit, well, it just doesn't pan out. Uh, think about it. Hollywood couldn't produce anything that looked like that at the time. Yeah, they were working on the Planet of the Apes, but the Planet of the Apes, all they had was just the head and the hands. Everything else was covered with clothing. Had Roger Patterson actually hoaxed Patty, he could have taken that film out to Hollywood and said, Look what I can do. And he'd have been a millionaire that year. Hollywood would have thrown money at him to reproduce that creature in various movies. Because that's how Hollywood does things. No, instead Roger Patterson spent the rest of his life running around the country looking for more evidence of Bigfoot. He didn't make millions of dollars like people think. And as he was dying... He never said that he had perpetrated a hoax. No, until his dying day, he believed that he had filmed Bigfoot walking along the side of the creek. I actually got to talk to Bob Gimlin one time in Tyler. He's a very interesting man, very nice. He doesn't take kindly to people who claim that he hoaxed anything. In fact, when he was interviewed on the radio by a man who then took the recording and chopped it up and spliced it back together, trying to make it sound as if Bob thought that Roger had hoaxed them. Well, he got a little upset. I don't think I'd want to have Bob Gimlin mad at me. Uh, he looks like he could be a real problem. No, Bob Gimlin believes that what they caught on film actually was a Bigfoot. The, uh, Bigfoot Conference in Jefferson. Back to that again. When I was first there, you find your seat. You claim it by leaving a notebook or a hat or something on the seat so nobody else comes and gets your spot. And then you go looking at the vendors. I was Christmas shopping. I like to get lots of books for all my nieces, nephews, people I know. As I'm walking through the vendor section, I look over and I see a man uh, sitting at a table that I knew. And I looked at him and he looked at me and smiled and I thought, what is Chris Holm doing at the Bigfoot conference? And I don't know how long I stood there, but then it's like, well, maybe I should go over and talk to him because I know the guy. 
I've been on his podcast and he's been on my podcast. Well, it didn't dawn on me that Chris is an artist. And he was there drawing pictures for uh, folks that wanted to buy a unique souvenir for their son, their daughter, or for themselves. Uh, so Chris had me sit down at his table. And he pulled out this neat little gadget. It was about the size of a, well, a book. He plugged a couple of microphones into it. He plugged a couple of headsets into it. And then he proceeded to do a podcast right there sitting at the Bigfoot conference. He interviewed me about my latest book, the uh, Fort Macintosh and the Paranormal. It felt a bit weird because when I'm doing a podcast, I'm sitting in my office studio and I'm surrounded by computers and computer screens and I've got keyboards and notes and coffee and all kinds of electronic devices that I'm not even too sure what all they do. Like the mixer. Well, Chris had, like I said, that little electronic gadget about the size of a buck. He had two microphones plugged into it, two sets of headphones, and that was his recording studio. He sent it out on the Facebook uh, later that day, and, well, I guess people could hear me talking if they wanted to. Very interesting, but very strange at the same time to actually do an interview in the middle of a Bigfoot conference. I hope he was able to get some of the speakers on as well, because it would make his show much better, much more interesting. The movie, The Legend of Boggy Creek, which came out in 1972, was what you would call a docudrama. It's a documentary that has been uh, beefed up a bit. Well, the original film, when it finally hit the studio... It was interesting. Yes, I went and seen it. Most of the people at the conference had seen it. Lyle Blackburn was telling one time that he was in the back seat of the car when I believe it was his parents went to see the movie. And his intention was to lay on the back seat and read comic books right up until the movie started. And then all of a sudden he was fixated by this creature. The storming about this small town in Arkansas, uh, yeah, Arkansas, uh, scaring the pants off of people. It led to him becoming interested in looking for Bigfoot. Most of the folks who are out there looking for Bigfoot will tell you that they saw The Legend of Boggy Creek, either 1972 when it first came out or uh, some time after. I even have a DVD here on the shelf of the original movie that I was able to purchase. Well, for those of you that haven't seen the movie yet, or maybe you saw it and you thought, well, it wasn't that good because the quality kind of wasn't so hot. Charles Pierce's daughter, I would mention her name, but once again, I can't find her name on my notes. I'll find it when I'm done. And stop recording. Anyway, Charles Pierce's daughter has managed to acquire the copyright to the movie. And she was able to track down a very good copy of the original 35mm. They took that original copy and they had it digitized and they've put it onto DVDs. They redid the audio as well. So now, if you want, you can actually buy a copy of The Legend of Boggy Creek that is in very good condition. You don't have to sit there and squint at the, the screen anymore trying to figure out what's that dark shape in that dark uh, woods that's supposedly scaring people. You can actually see details now. And from what people tell me, you can actually now see details that didn't show up in the original film. So, if you'd like, you can buy a copy of The Legend of Boggy Creek in Blu-ray, or you can just get the regular DVD, either one. When he originally made the movie, uh, Charles Pierce spent $100,000 filming, editing, producing the movie. 
Now, even back then, $100,000 was nothing for making a movie. Since that time, the movie has brought in over $20 million. So I would say the investment was pretty good. $100,000, $20 million income, and not too shabby. So, the next time in October of 2020, you'll want to attend the next Bigfoot conference because this is where you will actually get to meet the folks that you only watch on TV. I'm going to do my best to get Craig Woolheater on the show sometime in the future to tell the history of the TBRC. The conference, the first conference ever held, was in Jefferson. It was in October 2001, and it almost didn't happen. What else happened in 2001 that kind of changed the entire planet? Oh yes, 9-11. September 11th, 2001, our entire world changed direction. Craig's conference was being held the next month. And it almost didn't happen because, well, nobody could fly to Jefferson to be there to speak, and very few people even showed up for the conference. But fortunately, he soldiered on and had another conference the following year. And since that time, the conference has been in Jefferson several times, and it's been in Tyler a few times. I'm so glad it's back in Jefferson because it's such a neat little town. Definitely a tourist trap, but still, it's a neat town. You can go from one end of town to the other and not really spend a buck, but see a lot of interesting things. Well, I hope you enjoyed tonight's show. It was kind of uh, hurried together for various reasons. Next week, I hope to have this show a little more hammered out. Until next time, this is Chris James for Strange Things. Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? The same murder three. Strange things did happen here. No stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree.